So here is our morning reading, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body has finished with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for hu evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you've spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry. They're surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And for this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So let's continue to praise God together. We're going to sing together, Lord, I come to you, asking that God will restore us, strengthen us to serve him. We're going to sing the power of your love.
The Apostle Peter wrote this first letter to encourage Christians who are experiencing fierce persecution from the Roman Empire. And Peter points to Jesus, the suffering saviour, who gave his life as a sacrifice for sin and rose from the dead to give eternal life and the promise of heaven to all who put their trust in him. And when we build our lives on Christ, the cornerstone, we're being made into a spiritual building where the Holy Spirit dwells, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. So Christians are called to follow the example of Jesus and endure suffering, to live holy lives which bring glory to God. 1 Peter 2 verse 11, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to obtain, abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Living such good lives. 1 Peter chapter 4 spells out what that kind of holy living will involve. And it begins with turning away from sin. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body has finished with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their early lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Before we knew Christ, our lives were shaped by evil human desires. Now we'll want to do only the things that are pleasing to God. For you've spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. Some people who are Christians call themselves Christians anyway, seem to think these verses don't apply anymore. Now their behaviour is no different from all their neighbours and colleagues and friends. We've talked before about the detestable idols which so many people today are worshipping, the false gods of money, sex and power, of shopping and entertainment and celebrity. And Peter here lists some of the kinds of damaging behaviour which many people consider to be perfectly acceptable in today's world. New Living Translation puts it, you've had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy. Immorality, lust, feasting, drunkenness, wild parties, terrible worship of idols. If any proof were needed that these kinds of problems are still here in today's world, we need only point to the recent resignation of a certain cabinet minister who didn't resign because he was caught having an affair or because he abandoned his wife and children. Those immoral actions didn't really cause any scandal at all. He only went because he was caught breaking the COVID distancing rules, which he himself had imposed on the country. That demonstrates how far society's morals have departed from God's standards. They're surprised that you don't join them in reckless wild living. They heap abuse on you for this. Again, the New Living Translation, of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. Time and time again, the Bible teaches that the Christians are meant to stand out as different from the world around. People should be able to see the difference Jesus makes in our lives. Not that we have a puritanical attitude to enjoying life, but Christians don't need parties or drink or drugs or immorality to make us happy. And Peter reminds us that everybody will have to face the Holy God on the day of judgment. They will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So Christians will turn away from all kinds of sin, things we should never do. But then Peter goes on to some positive actions God is calling us to, starting with loving one another. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. And above all, love one another deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. 
love one another deeply because the end of all things is near. Jesus is coming back one day, maybe soon, maybe even today. So we should all be ready. I once heard this very wise advice. Never do anything you would be ashamed to be found doing at the moment that Jesus returns. Jesus is coming back soon. Therefore be alert, be of sober mind, so that you may pray. Be of sober mind, be serious, of sound mind, literally a wise mind, self-controlled. The root problem with immorality and lust and feasting and drunkenness and wild parties is that people lose control of themselves. Christians should be of sober mind, self-controlled. Titus 2.11 tells us the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. Self-controlled, upright, godly. And above all, says Peter, we should love one another Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. The Apostle Peter may not write about loving other people as much as the Apostle John does in his letters. But we've already had this encouragement earlier in chapter 1, verse 22, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Love one another deeply from the heart with God's kind of love, ag agape love, deep love, constant love, faithful love. Because love like that covers over a multitude of sins, as Proverbs 12, 10, 12 tells us. Love covers over all wrongs. Love covers all offences. So when Christians love each other, we'll forgive each other. We'll ignore each other's failings and shortcomings. And one expression of that love is hospitality. New Living Translation. Share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hospitality isn't the same as entertaining. Entertaining is a posh dinner, fine china. Hospitality means opening up your home, letting people find you just as you are. Remember that song from the musical Oliver, Consider Yourself at Home, Consider Yourself One of the Family. We've taken to you so strong, it's clear we're going to get along. Consider yourself well in, consider yourself part of the furniture. There isn't a lot to spare, who cares? Whatever we've got, we'll share. Hospitality means making others at home. And it's one of the things we've really missed over the last year a bit, just getting together and chatting with our friends, chatting after church on Sunday, chatting in a home group or a Bible study, just dropping around for a coffee to catch up, to see how folk are getting on. As life gets back to normal, one thing we can deliberately set out to do is to enjoy those times again. Practice hospitality. We read about the first Christians, they were like family to one another. And we should be loving one another deeply. Practice hospitality. And then there's something else all Christians can be doing to love each other, to build up the church, to serve God in the world. Peter says we should be using our gifts to serve others. Verse 10, each of you should use whatever gifts you've been given to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Every Christian has been given gifts by God, which we can use to glorify God. We've all got natural talents, we've got different skills we may have developed by training and experience, and we also have gifts which are given to us by the Holy Spirit to equip us to serve God. God's poured out his grace into each of our lives. We're stewards of that grace, says Peter. The Holy Spirit's at work in every Christian, equipping us to serve God in the church and in the world. 
Peter only lists two general categories of gifts, the gifts of speaking and the gifts of serving. And if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. Peter isn't just talking about preachers here. He's talking about every Christian when we have the opportunity to deliver God's messages. That includes preaching and teaching in the church. It includes when God gives us a message in prophecy or in a dream or in a vision. It also includes any of us talking about Jesus, sharing our faith with our friends. Whenever we speak for God, we should speak as one who speaks the very words of God. We should remember what a privilege it is to represent God as we teach or as we share our testimony. We should rely on God to give us the words to say. The Apostle Peter lists some of the spiritual gifts of speaking in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. And all of these are workings of one and the same spirit as he distributes them to each one as he determines. God's speaking gifts. We've talked about the priesthood of all believers, but the Bible also teaches us about the prophethood of all believers. That same Holy Spirit who spoke to the prophets in the Old Testament and in the early church is given to every Christian so that we can hear God speaking to us and we can deliver God's messages. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. And if we're not speaking, then we may have the gift of serving. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides. There are so many different ways we can serve God in the church and in the world. Anytime we're loving our neighbours, anytime we're helping other people, anytime we offer hospitality, any practical tasks God gives us to take on. In every situation, we should be serving God in the strength which God gives us, depending on the infinite resources of God, not just on our own human abilities. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Zechariah 6, verse 6 in, in chapter 4. We should all be using these God, gifts God has given us for God's glory. Paul gives very similar encouragement to the Romans in Romans 12, We've got different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is in serving, let him serve. If it is in teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is in contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. The different gifts God gives us. This last year has been very strange because most of the time we've not been able to use our gifts of speaking or serving as we used to before lockdown. We might have got out of practice at serving God. As things return to a new kind of normal, it'll be good to ask God how he wants us to serve him in the days ahead. Who does he want us to speak to? Who does he want us to help? What does he want us to be doing for him in the church and in the world? Perhaps he'll even give us new ways that we can be using the gifts he's given us that we've never used before as we step out in faith for him. But God calls us to be turning away from sin, to be loving one another deeply, to be using our gifts to serve others. Why do we do these things? so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. For these days ahead, let's offer to ourselves, ourselves up to God afresh, uh, so that he can work through us, so that God will be praised through Jesus Christ in the good deeds he leads us to do, in the ways that we love one another the ways that we speak for him, the ways that we serve him.
serving in the strength God gives us by his Holy Spirit, all for God's glory. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen.